Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're so glad you're tuning in today. And I'm so excited. I've got Dr. Thomas J. Ord. He go, we're just going to call him Tom today. All right. Good. But, good. Uh, yeah. Tom is, um, the director of the doctoral program of open and relational theology at North wind theological seminary. And he directs the center for open and relational theology. He's a prolific writer. And, uh, Tom, I, I, I have, uh, checked out those of you who are watching your last three books, God can't open and relational theology. And then, Pluriform love. Oh, thanks for looking right. at those. Yeah. So, uh, and I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I'm so excited. So folks, we're going to talk about God today, almost the whole time. Okay. But I am going to have you introduce yourself a little bit in your own story, but this will be kind of like taking a class on the attributes of God. How's that? <laughs> and I uh, love it. both both communicable and incommunicable attributes. <laughs> How's that? Ooh, so, fancy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like we're jumping into a theology class. And uh, <laughs> do you know God and what's God like and all that kind of stuff? So you do such a great job of talking about this. I love what you're doing. Um, but let's first jump into your story, uh, like where you were born, where you grew up. And uh, for my audience, Tom loves backpacking and uh, outdoorsy stuff. So we were already getting excited connecting over those things. <laughs> well, I grew up in a little farming community in Eastern Washington state. My father was a school teacher and came from the Dutch reform tradition. My mother was a entrepreneurial type and she came from the holiness Pentecostal traditions and uh, my father became kind of ecumenical as a young person because he was an excellent basketball player and played for a bunch of different church basketball teams and ended up dating this Pentecostal holiness girl. And they moved to this little farming community called Othello. And I grew up attending the Church of the Nazarene. I'm still a member of that denomination. In fact, an ordained elder in that community. Um, I was a person who tried to be a Christian for most, most of my life. Uh, growing up, I gave my heart to Jesus many times as a kid. And by the time I was in high school and college, I was a hardcore evangelist trying to convert people, save them from hell, and also dabbling in the charismatic Pentecostal tradition. But then uh, near the end of my college career, I took a course in philosophy of religion. And for the first time, I really took seriously and heard, really, um, the arguments against God's existence or arguments from other religious traditions. And for the sake of intellectual honesty, I had to admit that the reasons I had for believing in God weren't very strong. I remember coming to pick up my fiance, who's now my wife her getting in the car and me turning to her and saying, I just can't believe in God anymore. Um, I was an atheist agnostic for a short period. Um, I didn't stop believing in God because I was mad at the church or thought Christians were hypocrites or, you know, wanted to sow my wild oats as a <laughs> college student. For me, it was intellectual reasons that, led me away to belief. And it was intellectual reasons that brought me back to thinking it was more plausible than not that there is a God. And um, from that point, I started slowly rethinking, rebuilding my theology, 
I, I remember uh, you, you might enjoy this. I remember as a young, young husband looking for a job in the church, going to interview at this one particularly large church and the pastor asked me about Jesus. And this was not long after I had returned to believing in God after being an atheist. And I was ready to get rid of all kinds of <laughs> beliefs about Jesus I had grown up with because they, they were no longer plausible to me. Mm -hmm. So I told this pastor, well, I believe that there's a God of love. I think Jesus is pretty cool, but that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not get that job. <laughs> oh, those are pretty two really good points though you know I, yeah i still kind of <laughs> like them <laughs> but yeah. i say that just to say that from that point i slowly built to where i am now as an advocate of what you mentioned earlier as open and relational theology yeah yeah so i want to dive into this because i think i think a lot of my audience you know it, they aren't you know professional theologians and sure. all that kind of stuff and uh it's kind of interesting to me. Um, my audience knows I've been in recovery for about three and a half years and, you know, lead 12 step recovery stuff. And I, you know, I've thoroughly read the big book over the last three and a half years. And, you know, you have this higher power that the big book talks about, but yeah. what's fascinating is that at some points, like reading it, the big book as a theologian, which most people <laughs> in 12 step halls and AA halls, and even the people that wrote the big book, even though it's been, I think, used by God in an amazing way. There's over a hundred thousand uh, twelve-step groups in the world, and uh, it's been still for eighty-five something years. It's been one of the most effective things for helping addicts get sober. But um, if you read it theologically, it's like at some points it's thoroughly Calvinistic. <laughs> at yeah. some points it's very like radically free will. Uh, yep. At some points, it's almost like process theology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and some points, it's almost deistic, you know. And it's, uh -huh. and so it's just, it's. So in other words, it's like most people's theology. It's exactly. incongruent, inconsistent. Exactly. <laughs> it's so inconsistent. <laughs> we have this God who's schizophrenic at times, who's uh, yeah. actually, you know, pathological at times, <laughs> and who, you know, is incredibly loving and kind and beautiful at times. Anyway. Yeah. Kind of like nature, anyways. <laughs> anyway, rate, so your your book in 2019. Let's first talk about what, like, put it on the map for people who aren't, you know, theology theology students. What what is open and relational theology, as it just in layman's terms? Yeah, open and relational theology is a broad umbrella. And if we look at the two words, open and relational, it gives an idea of what the real fundamental basics are in that umbrella under which there's all kinds of variety and diversity. But the word relational means that God engages in both giving and receiving. God is interactive, we might say. And that will not sound weird to probably most of your listeners, because most people who read the Bible, at least, and take it seriously, see God described there as an interactive, engaging, giving and receiving kind of God. It's only when you point out that the major Christian theologians in history, people like Augustine, Aquinas, Martin Luther, John Calvin, they did not think that God receives they did not think that God was affected or had any emotions in relation to creation. And the relational part of open and relational says God is giving and receiving and has genuine emotions in response to creatures. Mm. The open part is a little bit stranger. Stranger? Is that is not quite the word? It's, it seems a little odd to people when they first hear it. The openness part means that God is moving through time into an open and yet to be determined a future. God doesn't predestine what's going to happen. Neither does God even foreknow with absolute certainty things that are going to happen. Rather, God is like us, moment by moment, acting in response to what's happened and to what's possible in the future. 
Now, those two are the big ideas. Under those, most people in the open and relational theology tradition affirm strong views of human free will. They rethink God's power. Uh, they have a certain view of the relationality of the world and the intrinsic value of things, et cetera, et cetera. But that's kind of the basic yeah. starting point. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so one of your books, 2019 is titled God can't, mm. and that's probably one of your most radical titles, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What God can't, God can do anything. Right. And so, um, so let's do the low hanging fruit first so that people can kind of get an idea like what, well, even like, let's say even like Calvinists who have this most, uh, you know, God's in control of every single thing that happens kind of idea. Um, but even in that world, there's some things that they would probably say God can't do. Right. That's right. And yeah. so let's start there with some of that low hanging fruit. Then let's get into uh, some of the communicable, incommunicable traits of God and, and talk about, what God can't do from that perspective, but first do the low hanging fruit. So people yeah. get a feel for what, what, what is it that God can't do? That most well, Christians let me start do. with two general categories. Uh, no matter if you're a Calvinist, Arminian, a process person, whatever, virtually every major Christian theologian has said, God can't do what is illogical or contradictory. God can't make two plus two equals seven. God can't make a married bachelor. God can't make a round square, things like this. Um, these things are not possible for anyone because they're just by their very nature impossible. They're illogical or contradictory. And then most have said there are certain things God can't do because to do them, God would contradict God's own nature. So when the biblical writers say God can't tell a lie, um, that is saying, well, God is a God of truthfulness and being truthful by nature, God can't be untruthful. Most would say God can't stop existing. God can't say, you know, it's been a good run, but tomorrow afternoon I'm out. Uh, that's just not possible. So just about everybody will at least say God can't do those two types of things. All right, cool. So then let's, so like if, if anybody in our audience would take a basic uh, systematic theology class, you know, one of the, one of the topics is going to be God, right? Yeah. One of the classics way, classic ways to present God is, is through this idea of incommunicable traits of God, attributes of God and communicable and so the communicable traits of God are the things that we're supposed to imitate like God is love. And by the way, folks, Tom is known as the theo theologian of love, which <laughs> so, so appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so that would be one thing. Yeah. Like we're God is love and we're supposed to, we're supposed to love like God or, or righteousness or something, you know, there's, there's things that, that are in the nature of God that we're supposed to imitate. But then there's this, there's this bunch of, incommunicable traits and uh, things like omnipotence, omnipresence, immutability, omniscience. These are things that it's not in the nature of human beings to possess those attributes. Right. And we can't, so we can't imitate those, but in open and relational theology and even in process theology, which I want to talk about a little bit, like in, open and relational or, or process theology, is there even such a thing as incommunicable traits of God? Yeah. If, if so, uh, which, which ones would you, wh how, how do you think about incommunicable traits of God as an open and relational theologian? Yeah. Well, there's a ton of really important <laughs> issues there. See if I can sort through a few of yeah, them. Yeah. Maybe I'll start with that passage in Ephesians chapter five, which Paul's talking to his audience and he's saying they ought to get rid of certain kinds of habits and put on certain practices. And then he says, imitate God as dearly loved children and live a life of love like Christ loved us and yada, yada, yada. And he keeps going. So um, Paul is saying we ought to imitate God. And as you rightly pointed out, 
the imitation there seems to be about loving like God loves. Now, if you look carefully at what I'll call classical theologies or traditional theologies, the way they talk about God's love, it's really hard to imagine how we could Im even imitate God's love uh, in, in those kinds of theologies. For instance, divine love in Thomas Aquinas is never emotional, never affected or influenced by others. And of course, in other traditions, divine love includes sending some people to hell forever, which sounds so unloving. And so even though most traditional theologies have wanted to say God is love, they've assumed certain kinds of philosophical frameworks or ways of thinking about God that contradict anything we know of as love. Or they've started with God's omnipotence and power and followed through with the logic of that and said things like, well, God loves you, but you don't have any freedom. God controls you, which, again, is not like anything we know as loving. And so what theologians have sometimes done is divided these attributes of God into those that we can imitate and those that we can't. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, almost all of them end up being ones that we can't imitate if we follow through with the logic. But of course, most classic theologians won't exactly shape them like that because most of them want to have some connection with scripture and the God of the Bible, the God revealed in Jesus uh, is one in which we should imitate, or we, we are like that God in some ways, but not in others. So maybe I'll conclude by saying, from my perspective, we have real power, but God is more powerful. I wouldn't say omnipotent. I wouldn't say almighty even. We have some power. God does not have all power, but is more powerful. I would say we are present in some places. God is present to all places. I would say we can love, but God is by nature loving. I would say we know some things. I would say God knows everything that's possible to know, but there are some things people think God knows that God doesn't know because they're not knowable. <laughs> How's that for a little teaser at the end? But that's the way I'd start to kind of parse out some mm -hmm. of the differences and similarities between God and us. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, reading years ago, a book called the prophets by uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel. And in there he had a chapter on God's pathos. Mm, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> he, he, he unpacked some of the Greek philosophers and, and how they had yeah. these ideas of uh, perfection and applied those to, you know, what God they, they conceived of as this perfect, immovable, immutable, um, you know, and, and it seems like a lot of Christians and particularly, uh, particularly Calvinists, um, have, have taken on some of those Greek, uh, categories of perfection and applied them to God. But Abraham Joshua Heschel, a rabbi, Jewish rabbi, who was a friend of MLK's, and uh, he he argued, you know, a Hebrew conception of God, God feels, and changes and is related and reacts and moves and, you know, very different from the yep. Greek, perf these ideal perfections kind of thing. So I, so like, if you think about, you know, one of the big ones that you, you challenge, I think, in all of your books is the, is omnipotence, like yeah. that category of perfection. And I think immutability. Yep. Which means, is, means God can't change. So he's unaffected. He's not moved emotionally by anything according to that concept of God. It's in most classic systematic theologies. Definitely. You would challenge both of those in certain yeah. ways, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, Heschel is a, a great open and relational theologian. So he's a part of the tradition I'm a part of as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, and not just Calvin is influenced by Greek metaphysics, but uh, most Roman Catholic theologians in history have been influenced by that philosophical assumption. Mm -hmm. And what's distinct about it and how it affects theology in ways I think are really negative is that 
Greek thought privileged unchangingness. It privileged a kind of perfection that could not be added to or subtracted from. And if you start with that sort of assumption about reality, that the best, the most perfect, the greatest conceivable thing is never changes, not affected, doesn't, um, has no emotion. Uh, yeah, it has well, no emotion. Like yeah, emotion no is one. evil in that kind of thought. Exactly. Thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, then you end up getting a God who is like all those characteristics. But I just can't imagine love being unemotional or unreceptive or unaffected. Imagine imagine f having a partner in life who never reacted to anything you did. That's not a real relationship. And yet that's the God conceived of by most major Christian theologians, not the God described in Scripture. You know, there's some problems with scripture. We can get into that if we want. But if you look at a general drift of God, the way God is portrayed in the Bible, it's not the God who's unmoved, unchanging, immutable, impassable, unaffected, etc. It's a God engaged in real give and receive loving relationships with us and creation. And so the problem in my mind is not so much that philosophy has uh, influence theology, because I think philosophy always influences theology. The problem is the kind of philosophy mm -hmm. or the philosophical ideas that have influenced so much of Christianity have been so unhelpful. Yeah. And the, the Greek concepts of perfection aren't Hebraic. No. Which means they're not rooted in the Hebrew Bible, which is our Old Testament, right? So. Yeah. Another way to put it is maybe is something <laughs> like this, Fred. Um it's one thing to say God is perfect and doesn't change in God's nature, but maybe there's another way in which God can perfectly change in God's experience. So maybe the Greeks have half the truth. <laughs> maybe we don't want to say, you know, God's nature changes so that one week God is loving and the next week he'll kick your butt. But Maybe there's another way to talk about God perfectly changing moment by moment in giving and receiving relationships with us in creation. Mm. Yeah. And I, I love the, the work, you know, you did on the, you know, almighty, um, the, mm. the Hebrew names for God that like El Shaddai and stuff and how you kind of re did some good word study around that showing that it, like really the old, the Hebrew Bible doesn't teach omnipotence like we think about it yeah um yeah you know did i send you the book that i'm currently writing <laughs> because that makes me think i did did i send that to um you? i may have heard that on a podcast or something did oh, i okay so i might i might have just heard that somewhere <laughs> yeah well i'm Listen glad you brought it several of your podcasts so <laughs> <laughs> good yeah. good yeah 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 i mean the book i'm currently writing has another audacious title it, the title is the death of omnipotence okay. and one chapter looks at uh, the what we call the old testament and the new testament and the words that have been translated almighty el shaddai is one from the old testament um sabaoth is another from the old testament in the new testament it's the word pantocrator and those words should not be translated almighty they're mistranslations and yet so many christians take the the um, those words think God is omnipotent or almighty when the Bible doesn't support those views. Hmm. Hey, so um, you might know this already, but uh, you know how word studies are being reworked all the time because sure. some of the ancient ways we did word studies, even the way Kittle did them, you know, and yep. stuff is is not, uh, you know. Anyway, there's a lot of work being done all around the world with word studies in the Hebrew and the Greek. And, uh, there's a, there's a professor that teaches Hebrew and is also writing a commentary on the Septuagint at a Southern seminary where Al Mohler is at. So very Calvinistic, right? But he's a Canadian guy. Who's one of the most brilliant Hebrew linguists living today, Peter Gentry. Hmm. Peter did a rework the word studies on Kadosh holiness. And, you know, that this plays into the transcendence of God, you know, and the imminence of God, the nearness of God or, and, and classically we've 
uh, like even R.C. Sproul has interpreted holiness as, as like separate, transcendent, completely other. But Gentry uh, has written on this. You could look him up, Peter Gentry, and he's reworked the word study. I, it's, I think convincingly so that actually Kadosh means devoted. Huh. It's not separate. It's devoted, actually. And God is transcendent in his devotedness, his wow. transcendent love, if you want to. You, you can. <laughs> so check that I'll out. Definitely look for that. Yeah. That Thank out. you. Peter Gentry, his studies on Kadosh, uh, really fascinating stuff, which changes things, right? Like if you definitely. go back and rethink. And I noticed you wrote a book. I didn't read it on relational holiness year, several years ago. But I, I, when I saw the title, I thought, huh, uh, because I've, I've, t I've grabbed hold of that and re thought about God's holiness from a totally different angle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think God's I ever separate from us. I don't either, but you and I are in the minority <laughs> on that position. <laughs> we are. <laughs> but here's a guy that teaches at Southern who's yeah. written on this. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Especially the way that word holy in more conservative circles has been used to say, God is so different from you and me. And in fact, in my tradition, uh, the church of Nazarene, the, the Methodist tradition, uh, there are some who want to emphasize holy as a descriptor for love. So they'll say, God isn't love. God is holy love. And they do that partly because love is a word that is obviously has lots of different meanings, but mostly because holy love seems to make God so much different from us. Our love is not holy. God's love is holy. Um, but that's a, a way of drawing these sharp distinctions that if Kadosh is better understood as together with or devoted to, then we have this kind of intimate relationship that the word love itself, I think, rightly understood connotes i'm i'm 100 percent there check yeah. that out tell me what you cool. think yeah okay yeah all right so um yeah so then like you do you do believe that god is omnipresent i do yeah so that's one of the classical categories that you would hold on to in terms of yeah you know and i even believe god is omniscient mm -hmm. all-knowing it's just that I think there's nothing about the future that's yet knowable by anyone. Okay. Um, if you let me define omnipotent in the way I wanted to, I could probably even say God is omnipotent, but I've given up on that word because I think it's so lodged in the minds of people as meaning God either has all the power or exerts all the power or controls other or even could control. Hmm. And I think those ways of thinking about God's power run us headlong into the problem of evil right. and asking, you know, why doesn't God prevent the crap that goes on in our lives and in right. the world? I'm going to get into that here in a minute. Uh, but you've, you've, you've actually coined a new term instead of omnip omnipotence, you've coined a term, what? You go ahead. Amipotence. Okay. What does this mean? Ami, yeah. Yeah. Ami is a Latin prefix for love. And then of course, potence is power. So this is the idea that God's power is the power of love. And even more so that we should understand God's power in the light of, or through the lens of love. And if love is not controlling, then we shouldn't think God's power is controlling. If love is both giving and receiving, then we should think that God's power has a receptive element to it um, and so on. But omnipotent rather than omnipotent. Mm. All right. Good stuff. Um, so I remember, you know, I got saved at a Baptist youth camp and I was doing drugs and, you know, got saved from drugs and Jesus saved me. And felt called two, two months later to be a pastor. So I, my June, my sophomore year in high school, I was like in the rec athlete rec recreational drug crowd. And then I went back and saved and started the fellowship of Christian athletes <laughs> and felt called to be a pastor. Um, then I went to Baylor. Well, Baylor and I was there 79 to 83. It was actually all of my professors were like liberal classic you know, like they were into Schleimacher huh. and Tillich and Bultmann. And wow. like, yeah, this was back before the Southern Baptist. You know, it was actually right. I was right there when the early 
conservative takeover the Southern Baptist was taking off. Okay. And Baylor was actually a, a, a lightning rod point because the, the, the conservatives thought the Baylor professors were way too liberal, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who were some like of your that, professors? I, I'd be curious on the names. Well, it's interesting. Mike Clausen, who is working with, uh, uh, the, with one of the branches of, uh, Richard Rohr's group, okay. uh-huh. uh, did his PhD at Baylor recently with a, with, with a history professor that I had there, which was kind of crazy, uh, named Pitts, Dr. Pitts, but God, I, I would have to name. go back, man. I haven't thought of these guys' names forever, but yeah, yeah there was Craps and Man- McKnight, there was a, an, uh, an, an old, there was a new Testament scholars, uh, a guy named Flanders was there. Uh, I gosh, I can't. Yeah. That's I, it's all right. been so long ago. I can't bring it up, but I was going to say they had me reading process theology huh. <laughs> saved 18 year old kid. Wow. And, you know, they didn't believe in demons and all this stuff. And I'm like going, I think I had a couple, you know? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, and so what was funny was I was reading like Hartsorn and um, Whitehead and I, I, I haven't gone back and read them, but I'm going to start. But um, I remember Hartshorn was felt a little easier to read for me back then for some reason. But even yeah. though I was really good at math. I think I think he was a bit of a mathematician, if I'm not mistaken. I'm I could be wrong. It's about actually that. Whitehead was the mathematician. Okay, but okay. I, I do think one or the other. Was, yeah, was harder to read, but um, but I remember thinking, gosh, it's like God is evolving. It was mm. kind of like my 18 year old take mm-hmm. on process theology. And I wasn't like against it, but I, I, because I'd had this radical experience, I kind of drifted toward like more conservative intellectual theologians, maybe sure. like a guy like N.T. Wright today or something like that. But, yeah. but, um, but, and they, my professors were so loving and kind, they were fun to interact with and they were super thoughtful and I didn't go away hating all of the, the liberalism that they introduced me to, you know, but, uh, but pro- is open relational theology different from process theology? Yeah, I think of process theology as one option under the open and relational umbrella. Okay. I would put it this way. All process theologians are open and relational, but not all open relational thinkers are process. Um, so you'll have some people who just call themselves relational theologians or openness theologians or feminists or post-colonial or whatever label they have. They think the future is open that God is relational, but they might not agree about with process people about God's power, for instance, um, or some other issue. So open and relational is the broader umbrella under which sits process theologies. Mm. So, um, so in, in process theology, would, would people hold on to um, omniscience like, like you described it? Yeah, they could, uh, they could affirm omniscience in the way I described it, which okay. is God knows everything that is possible to know. Okay. Uh, yeah. I remember reading a book on God's foreknowledge and the subtitle was what does God know and, and when does he know it? Uh, okay. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I would say God knows everything that's knowable in any moment, but the next moment adds more information to be known. And so God learns and adds that information to God's knowledge. So you might say God's knowledge grows moment by moment. When I went through my meltdown after, you know, pastoring and leading people to Jesus for 40 years and being in the vineyard movement. Uh, I went through a horribly dark time and like during my uh, addiction to Xanax and alcohol, and then, you know, my, my marriage failure and all that stuff, I really felt lost. Like I felt completely disconnected from me, from God, from my calling and every, like I was just gone. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it felt like I was an atheist. Like I, the feeling was that like God's not there. And right. I had always loved science. Like I've never been a young earth guy. I've always been into science. I've always tried to integrate science and faith. I've always believed in evolution, you know, like at least a God involved kind of, ev- you know, some kind of deistic evolution or something, but not necessarily yeah. theism. Like when I read like Francis Schaefer, 
language of God, I felt it was a little bit too deistic for me, you know, but, uh, yeah. um, but at any rate, um, but so, so I had those thoughts that came into my mind in those dark, dark days and could have easily gone atheist from that angle. Right. But then the other thing for me, and it's so weird cause I'd helped so many people through suffering and hardship and, you know, help people hang on to their faith. But then when I went through this thing, I lost mine. It felt, I felt like totally shattered. Yeah. yeah. And you know, um, and the thing for me was like, I had played, prayed a million prayers to not fall. Like yeah. I fell, I blew apart. I yeah. you know what I mean? Like I, and I was so, uh, hated myself so much that I didn't care if I died. And I was like, I prayed a million prayers not to fall. Yeah. <laughs> and I fell. And aren't those prayers according to God's will? Right. And then the other thing was like, if you, if I went through the details of the persons and the situations and circumstances of my fall, it's like God set certain people into my life for 30 years and preordained it. Like <laughs> I went back and look at how, if I went through all the setup, of my fall, it almost feels like God preordained it because, and, wow. and it's so com it's very complex and it's hard to, and I won't try to unpack it, but because of all that, I thought, well, shit, I thought God was my friend mm -hmm. and like a friend wouldn't do this to me just to teach yeah. me something. What? Right. Bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. You know, like, yep. God, God, you know, so then it, then it just threw me into that whole so emotionally now, all of a sudden, even though intellectually and pastorally, I'd help people through all kinds of suffering of every kind. But then when I was in this dark place, I couldn't pull myself out of it. And I no. couldn't not be honest about it either, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not in that dark place anymore, but and then and now I'm kind of actually, I'm revisiting, you know, like the open relational process to try to hang on to this stuff. Yep. But one of the problems I you know, the problem of evil is the classic problem. I mean, from, Job, from Job till now. Right. And, uh, you know, Job doesn't ever solve the problem. He just ends in mystery and paradox, you know? Yeah. yeah. Which I, I wrote a blog called was Job a Buddhist, you know, which yeah, I love it. <laughs> Job, that was probably written way before Buddha was alive, you know, but, uh, he was definitely interacting with some, some very Eastern thought there, I think, but nonetheless, what what's evil about is do you believe in an ontological do you believe in a satan a demon or some kind of ontological reality i'm going to get a little philosophical here and then yeah are you a some substantive dualist does that uh, make yeah yep. and i might not even be asking but to me those two things play into each other a little bit but maybe yep. you know so like if uh, yeah so all right. So let me start with that a little bit. Yeah. Let me start with Satan and then I'll get around to substance dualism uh, or um, the theology I affirm does not require belief in Satan. I personally doubt there is a Satan. If by Satan, we mean a being who is, uh, has power nearly equal to God is omnipresent somehow can be, you know, in China tempting people at the same time it's tempting me. Um, this kind of vision of Satan, which is, has is fairly common in popular circles. Mm -hmm. I don't think has biblical support and doesn't make a lot of sense to me. However, yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I'm open. Say, I never, even when I believed in a, you know, these beings, <laughs> yeah. Um, I never put them, I never gave them the classic attributes that God has. Okay. Yeah. You know yeah. What I'm saying? <laughs> yep. Like they yep. had to be anyway, but go ahead. However, I'm more open to the possibility of demons as ontological beings. Hmm. Now, I don't think that God would have created them evil. I don't think they are inherently evil. I think they're redeemable. They might be something akin to, uh, minds of people or creatures who have passed away, have long passed, but continue to have negative influence in the world. Um, I'm not 
set on their existence. My theology can function perfectly fine without demons, but I'm not opposed to them in the same way I'm opposed to a classic view of Satan. Interesting. For the yeah. people I've been talking to lately, uh, virtually nobody would uh, would say that <laughs> would give a possibility for ontological reality to demons. Um, yeah, yeah. Now I like I've always believed that, and you know it's so strange because uh, I've been you know like I've trained people you know to pray for the sick and you know all these things. Sure. Believe, yeah. I've never I've always believed that God could do things supernaturally, you know? So, you know, like I'm obviously rethinking a lot of all of that stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, but, uh, and I'd thought deeply about it, even, you know, as practicing, you know, I always thought, well, Hey, if we're praying for the sick and we pray well with love, then, it, then the least that can happen is that people feel loved and cared for mm, solidarity yeah, yeah. with those who are struggling. Right. You no. Know? Right. Yeah. But, there were times when I prayed for people that or and, and not just me, other people, it seemed like something miraculous happened, you know, it's like, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like cancers are gone and different things. I mean, like I, you know, some yeah. of those things are documentable, but, but yeah, then, you know, obviously some people, when they think about evil, they just, they just blame it all on Satan. Right. And God, like, especially the, the Arminian camp. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, God's not, doesn't do anything evil. The Calvinist camp doesn't really get around it that way. Right? <laughs> no, because God's doing everything. God's doing everything. They, they, right. They just reject the notion that what we think is evil is truly evil from the divine perspective. Um, yeah. So the Arminians, they want to say, yep, there's real evil in the world. They'll say God allows it, but they won't say God causes it. Yeah. And then, as you rightly say, they'll point to Satan as maybe the tempter, um, and then, you know, if you push them, then we get to the second part of your question, which is the ontological status of an ultimate duality of good and evil. Right. Um, and it sounds sometimes that people think that the devil is somehow almost co-equal with God. Maybe not quite. I don't think they'd ever actually say that. But the way they talk about the attributes of this uh satanic being sounds an awful lot like just the negative side of God. But when you press them, they will usually give the story of Satan and angels falling from heaven somewhere in the past, which would mean that Satan was formerly an angel, which would mean then that since angels can't be intrinsically evil, um, that maybe even own the Satan's own ontology is intrinsically good. And so you get people like Irenaeus um, who will say the, the devil will eventually be redeemed. The, right. event, the devil will yeah. eventually, you know, agree to with God. Uh -huh. um, now my own view, again, I'm not committed. I, I doubt there's a Satan. I'm open to the possibility of demons, but I don't think they're intrinsically evil. If they exist, I think they're redeemable too. But what makes my view going to sound weird to some people listening is I think God has always everlastingly been creating, been creating in relation to or out of what God previously creating. And when I say everlastingly, I mean with no beginning. So I reject creation out of nothing, which is not in the Bible, but has been affirmed by lots of people throughout the centuries. Right. So I have a God who's everlastingly creating out of, or in relation to that, which God previously created with no absolute beginning, which means that in my way of thinking, there's always been some creaturely others in relation to God everlastingly. Now, this really fits nicely if you think God is relational, because you can say it's God's very essence to be related to creaturely others. And it's been that way everlastingly. But what it also means is that because there's always been creaturely others, and creaturely others can't be controlled by God, in my view. Creaturely others can choose to do evil. 
So in my system, the possibility, not the necessity, but the possibility for evil is baked in to creaturely existence. It's a possibility God can't get rid of single-handedly. But because God's love is relentless, God can always call creatures to the good, to love, to beauty. And there's the real hope that God's invitations will ultimately persuade absolutely everything persuadable, every creature that can be persuaded by God. And so we have the ultimate redemption or reconciliation of all things. But it's not because God forced that re reconciliation. It's because God's persuasive and relentless love ended up convincing everyone to say yes to love. Mm -hmm. That's a long answer. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, but that option, you know, you think about, you know, like the children always ask the toughest questions, like where did God come from? And, you right. know, like, I, like Genesis 1, 1 and 2 don't teach creation out of nothing. It no, teaches no. some kind of primordial chaos and right. you know, God starts separating and ordering and that kind of thing. And, um, and I, I, you know, and if you think about evolution, you know, death and destruction have been a part of it from the beginning too. Right. It's an interesting yep. thing to try to figure out just the natural order of death and destruction and how that creates suffering. And, and if that. you start with a God who can create out of nothing, which is the standard way, a Roman Catholic, an Arminian, a Calvinist, a Anabaptist, you just, you know, start naming your Christian traditions, practically every one of them, except maybe Mormons, have that kind of view. Well, then you have to make God somehow directly or indirectly the author for evil, or at right. least the possibility for evil. And that, in my way of thinking, makes God less than perfectly loving. So I'm proposing a view that gets God out of that jam and says that it's not like there was God walking along one day and said, hey, there's some stuff out there I've never seen before. I think I'll make a world out of it. It's that God has everlastingly been creating out of that which God previously created. Yeah. And it's a mystery. Like, why is there something rather than nothing? I think like if you were raising your kid atheist and, you know, explaining the big bang is like, well, what? You know, we, we go, our kids go, where, where did God come from? They're, those kids, I imagine, go, where does matter come from? You know, where does, yes. where does something come from? Right. Yeah. Just, In philosophy, we call those metaphysical ultimates. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a metaphysical ultimate. That is, everybody's got an assumption about the reality of something that can't be traced to something else. For most Christians, that metaphysical ultimate is God. For most materialists, that metaphysical ultimate is matter. For me... It's God and matter all the way down. Yeah. Turtles all the way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what about substantive dualism? Yeah. So usually when people talk about substance, yeah, dualism, they're they, asking the wrong question here, but um, yeah, they usually have an, in mind the question of mind uh, material dualism. That yeah. is they look at the world and they say, well, rocks, plants, they don't have minds. How is it that you and I have minds? Because we all believe we have minds. Even people who say they don't, they all act as if they do. So then the question in philosophy is, how did mind emerge from matter? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one answer is mind is totally an illusion. We may think we have minds, but we don't. Mm -hmm. Another answer is, well, everything is mind. What we think is matter is actually mind, uh, but they're all just ideas. That's idealism. My view says everything that exists has an element of mind and matter in it. Uh, the way those elements are arranged are going to vary. So a worm, for instance, is going to be an organism, whereas a rock isn't. But the very constituent parts of worms and rocks have both mental and physical dimensions. In fact, this might sound really weird, but I even think God has mental and physical dimensions. Um, but as a spirit, we can't see God's material dimensions. It's a kind of like a human mind. So anyway, that's usually what people are talking about when they're asking the questions about substance dualism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, to me, it, it play, you know, because, you know, when you study the neuroscience of the brain and human mm -hmm. consciousness is still, I mean, even if you talk to 
you know, atheist evolutionists, that's still the most puzzling. Yes. The whole thing, yep. right? <laughs> yep. Well, if you start with the assumption that we know there's matter in the world, then it's a real puzzle. How did mind or consciousness emerge from matter? Mm -hmm. But if you start from the assumption that, of course, we know we're conscious, I mean, we're having this conversation, we're self-aware, um, then the question is, okay, then how do we know that the book or the computer we're looking at or whatever, that how do we know that that is actually matter if we know for sure that we're mind? Mm -hmm. And I'm proposing a way to bring those two together. I call it material mental monism. Mm -hmm. Everything that exists has both materiality and mentality. Mm. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> That's a real rabbit hole. We I know, I know. So I'm going to pull us out of that one real quick. We, we're kind of running out of time, but um, so let's talk about like what God can do with these thoughts that we've kind of mm. explored here. Um, like Jehovah Jireh provider. Can, can God provide? And if so, how, how would he go about it or how would he, she, it go about it? <laughs> yeah. So in my view, God can do all kinds of things like yeah, provide. And, and I kind of want to go provide, protect, heal. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's God just do them all at once. Can God yes. guide us or speak to us or put thoughts in our brain? These are the kind of things I want you to kind of wrap up for us here in the last few minutes. I know that's yeah. a lot, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I can do that by sort of making some general statements. I think God always acts. So it's not like God is doing nothing or standing on the sidelines or twiddling thumbs on Mars. God is active everywhere at all times, both giving and receiving. So I've got a God who always acts at all times. But I think this acting is always uncontrolling love. And that means that God requires creaturely cooperation for the kind of outcomes or results God wants, either creaturely cooperation or in terms of inanimate matter, the conditions of creation to be conducive for the results and outcomes God wants. So God's guidance, God's protection, God's healing, God's rescuing, all of those, I think, involve God acting first and calling creatures to respond and when we respond well to God's call, we can be the kind of uh, guides or uh, protectors, or we can be healed in the way God wants. Um, so my favorite illustration of this is to go back to the time in which I asked my wife to marry me. I acted. I said, will you marry me? But in order for us to be officially engaged, she had to say, Yes, I will. So it took a response, a positive response for the outcome that I wanted. I think that's the same with God. God's always acting and inviting and calling and persuading and wooing and sometimes even commanding, but not, not, but not ever controlling. God always requires response. Mm. Yeah. And I, you know, it's funny. There's some people who are like, you know, just super comfortable with like God's in control and, yeah. um, you know, and like, and he's loving and, but, you know, you come to these most horrific of evils that we face. Yep. Well, God allowed it. Well, if God had power and he could stop it and he doesn't like, what exactly. kind of God is that, you know? And exactly. if, you get, if you really think through some of those things, which I think this is, you know, it, all of a sudden you end up with this pathological schizophrenic God who just <laughs> nobody would want to be around. Like yep. who wants to be around a God like that, you know, I, like, which is why not only do your everyday person who thinks about this very long, but your most celebrated academic scholars, when they get into this discussion, they'll eventually reach into their back pocket and pull out a big fat honking mystery card. And they'll say, oh, well, God's ways are not our ways. Who are we to know the mind of God? Which is just cheating, yeah. <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah. it's what they're saying up front is God is like this. But then when you press the logic of it, they're playing that mystery card. Right. Um, I, I, we all yeah. play it somewhere, right? Don't you think? I don't degree? play the mystery card. 
I don't. What play about it. your beginnings with the metaphysical? What did you call it? The beginning yeah. you have to begin with. What's that? So there's two ways of thinking about mystery. One okay. is, can I be certain about things? If that's what it means to play the mystery card, I, and I think everyone should do that. Right. Not everybody does. So I don't know with certainty the proposals I'm giving you are the right ones. So in that sense, there's mystery. Okay. What I object to is when people give you a model of God and there's a big old hole in the middle of it, that's a mystery. They say all these other parts, they, they either know them or at least they're confident of them. But then when you put them all together, there's this big mystery. I'm against the mystery in the middle of the model. Okay. Whether or not the model is right, I think no one knows for sure. So yep. there's mystery there. So a metaphysical, a metaphysical assumption at the beginning of all things. Yeah, we're all we all should claim mystery on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I love your work, Tom, and I well, I love, thank you. Uh, how you talk about it and you do it with such uh, grace and love, and it's really uh, really appreciated it a lot, and it's it's really. Um, you know, just help me through some of the stuff I've been going through. Um, so greatly, greatly appreciate it. I, I, well, thanks I for love, taking it seriously. I love the God of love, you know, and yeah, favorite new verse, you know, first John four is like, God is love. Those who live in love, live in God and God lives in them. Mm, yeah. It's like, how uh, can you four, go seven and eight? <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one who doesn't love doesn't know God for God is love. <laughs> uh, so those, that's where I'm hunkering down these days. And uh, yeah. Well, if, so if I if appreciate were, it, I hope that we can stay connected uh, me too. in the future and maybe I'll try to show up at one of your things or something or bring awesome. you to, get you here to Kansas city. Yeah, I I'm, I used to come to Kansas City. It seemed like every other year, uh, one of my good friends and recently completed doctorate with me, a guy named Jonathan Foster is in Kansas City. Do you happen to know him? No, I don't. Um, he was Nazarene, but then he got the boot because he's LGBTQ affirming. And so hmm. he's no longer. But yeah, um, yeah. This new little church uh, that I'm pastoring now is uh, Disciples of Christ. So I kind of like the fact they're open and affirming and non credal you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, to see where this goes, but um, I, I'm definitely wanting to be introducing my people to you. So it was a real well, privilege thank you. At the beginning to uh, be able to do an interview with you. Thanks for taking the time. How can people connect with you and turn, I know we got your, your books, uh, but how about websites? And then you even, are plugging a conference that you have coming up an open and relational conference. Yeah. And we'll kind of go out with uh, some of that. Great. Well, there's an upcoming online conference, February 10 and 11 called Ortline 23 open and relational theology online conference. It features 17 sessions on 17 recently published books in open and relational theology. And you can find information on the Eventbrite, um, um, what's it called? Channel website, Eventbrite. <laughs> Look at that. Um, also, this coming summer, there's a week-long conference uh, between Yellowstone and Tetons uh, called OrtCon 23. And that's an in-person event that it's a lot of fun in terms of finding me, me so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> in terms of finding me, my personal website is my full name, Thomas J Ord. You spell Ord O O R D.com. And, uh, or you can go to the center for open and relational theology, which is C the number four, the letters O R T.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, what a blessing. Thank you so much. Um, I was so happy when you responded to my request. I, oh man, this is awesome. So uh, I, uh, I hope to keep hanging out with the, the process crowd and good, uh, good, good. Uh, I haven't met, you know, Brian McLaren's become a, a real friend, but uh, good, you know, and a few, few people, Richard Rohr, somebody sent me a book by Richard Rohr when I was in my darkest moment, feeling like an atheist uh, kind of falling upward. And I started devouring Rohr, which, you know, good. got me to all kinds of places. And uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, those are two good guys right there. Yeah. 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 
So, all right. Well, blessings. Well, yeah. Thanks for joining us on spiritualityadventures.com. Thanks for everybody to, uh, thanks for joining in on this uh, podcast and we'll see you next time. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.